This meeting of the Senate Judiciary Committee will come to order. Our hearing today is entitled Evading Accountability, Corporate Manipulation of Chapter 11 Bankruptcy. In October of 2021, Johnson & Johnson faced lawsuits from nearly 40,000 Americans who had been diagnosed with ovarian cancer or mesothelioma allegedly caused by the company's talc-based talc -based products. Rather than defend against these claims in district court or settle with victims, Johnson & Johnson used a legal maneuver known as the Texas Two-Step in an attempt to skirt and limit accountability and liability. Under this bankruptcy maneuver, J&J transferred its legal liabilities to a shell company called LTL Management. Johnson & Johnson then moved that shell company to a friendly jurisdiction, put it into bankruptcy, and asked the court to stay all litigation against the still solvent and highly profitable parent company, Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson is not the only wealthy corporation to use the bankruptcy system to try to limit exposure and evade accountability. We now turn to a video to detail some of these abuses. Years and really more intensely over the last two to three years, a lot of very wealthy corporations and individuals have begun finding loopholes in federal bankruptcy law. My name is Kimberly Naranjo, and I'm here to ask you for your help. I have been diagnosed with mesothelioma, which is a terminal cancer that's caused by one thing and one thing only, exposure to asbestos. After spending hours going over every place I've ever lived or worked, it was determined that the only way I was exposed to asbestos was from Johnson & Johnson's baby powder. The fabulously wealthy uh, corporation create a subsidiary, push it into bankruptcy, and then try to piggyback on that bankruptcy in order to block tens of thousands of lawsuits. I am a voice for the thousands of people that Johnson & Johnson have harmed, and we have a right to be heard. 200,000 military service members and veterans suing 3M, claiming the company's earplugs were defective. 3M's legal strategy? Putting its subsidiaries into bankruptcy protection. They knew that they were issuing a defective product, that they're trying to uh, scheme away through either bankruptcy or through these arguments to try and avoid responsibility for what they've done. And, and you have a lot of legal scholars, a lot of members of Congress saying, wait a minute, wasn't bankruptcy just supposed to be for actual bankrupt, insolvent companies? And Ms. Naranjo was a witness at our earlier hearing and sadly has passed away. I don't come to this hearing as an expert in bankruptcy. My exposure to the subject is a law school course and the fact that in my regular practice of law in the city of Springfield, Illinois, I was named a trustee in bankruptcy for a gas station. So I do not, I never played at the highest levels. But I think what we're addressing here uh, is certainly the jurisdiction of this committee and timely uh, and appropriate for this hearing. We acknowledge corporate bankruptcy plays an important role in our economy. It is meant to allow a company in financial distress to go before a bankruptcy court, agree to certain conditions, and exchange get protection. This provides space for the company to negotiate with its creditors to reach a compromise on how the company's debts will be addressed, all under the watchful eye of the bankruptcy court. If all goes well, the debtor is given a fresh start, an opportunity to move on without the burden of unmanageable debt. That's the fundamental principle at the root of the bankruptcy system. The idea that financial calamity shouldn't be a death knell for every business. That innovation and risk can be good and that the law should provide for second chances. But if a company is going to be freed from its debts, there has to be some cost. The company has to accept oversight of the bankruptcy court. It has to compensate its creditors according to their interest. It has to limit its operation during the course of the proceedings. Recently, certain corporations have decided they'd rather not accept that arrangement. They want all benefits of bankruptcy without the cost. The video featured testimony from Kimberly Naranjo, a mesothelioma victim who testified last year and, as I mentioned, has since passed away. We are joined today by another mesothelioma victim, 
Justin Bergeron, a young father still fighting to hold Johnson & Johnson accountable. While Johnson & Johnson's potential liability to Ms. Naranjo, Mr. Bergeron, and thousands of other Americans is substantial, it isn't something this company can't handle. At the time it executed the Texas Two-Step, Johnson & Johnson was valued at more than $420 billion. That year, it made nearly $64 billion in profit. When the court rejected their attempt to use this maneuver as a bad faith scheme, Johnson & Johnson sent its shell company, LTL Management, back into bankruptcy a mere two hours later. Unbelievable. We've seen a similar playbook used by 3M to try to avoid accountability for allegedly selling defective combat earplugs to our troops for more than 200,000 service members. We'll hear from Lori Knapp, whose father tragically died of mesothelioma allegedly caused by products manufactured by Georgia Pacific, another corporation. She still hasn't been able to hold the company accountable due to this bankruptcy scheme. These maneuvers are blatant attempts by wealthy corporations to buy bypass our tort, tort system, to simply decline to be held liable. And we have every reason to expect that corporations, at least those with deep enough pockets, will continue to try to manipulate bankruptcy in similar ways. That's not what the Congress intended when it created bankruptcy. It's not something we should allow to continue. With that, I'll turn to Ranking Member Graham for his opening statement. 